In this presentation, we will take a look at the chapters 18 through 24 in the book of Mosiah. So let's take a look at some of the doctrines and principles as taught in Mosiah 18 through 24. Let's begin with Mosiah 18:24, an introduction to these chapters. The people who followed Alma into the wilderness humbled themselves by believing the word of God, repenting and accepting the covenant of baptism. Even so, they fell captive to the Lamanites for a length of time. In the same period of history, the people of Limhi continued to live under Lamanite dom domination. They eventually humbled themselves after failing to free themselves by their own strength and were delivered by God. Alma's people and Limhi's people both experienced bondage and oppression, and both groups experienced the blessings of being set free by the hand of the Lord. The Lord allowed Alma's and Limhi's people to be placed in bondage, where the only way out was to turn to and rely on the grace of the Lord, thus showing the people that whether spiritual or physically, the only way out of bondage from the natural man and our fallen nature is only through the Savior and his atonement. That's probably one of the main reasons for these two stories, is to show that our only escape from the things of the world, brothers and sisters, is through the atonement of Jesus Christ. The only way out of the bondage of sin is through the Savior. We cannot save ourselves from the conditions of mortality, no matter how hard we try. One of the main principles, the stories of Alma and Limai's people, is to show us that there shall be no other name given, no other way nor means whereby salvation can come into the children of men only in and through the name of Christ, the Lord Omnipotent. Look for ways the Lord provides redemption from the difficulties of mortality by strengthening us and assisting us in our troubles. By comparing and contrasting the circumstance of the, of the two societies, we can learn principles to help us deal with our challenges. Let's now focus on Mosiah chapter 18. 18 verse 1, the phrase, Alma repented of his sins. Just how involved Alma was in King's known way of life before his conversion, we have no way of knowing. We do know, whatever the depth of his transgressions, that his repentance was genuine and the renovation of his soul complete. He lived thereafter a life of unquestionable integrity and kept the laws of God with fidelity and devotion. Chapter 18, verse 2, Alma taught that which he had learned from Abinadi, namely, Jesus Christ and him crucified. The atonement is the fundamental principle of Christianity, a central doctrine on which all other doctrines resolve, revolve, and of which all other principles are but appendages. So, brothers and sisters, our main focus then should be on Christ and him crucified and resurrected. Chapter 18, verse 3, the phrase, many to believe his words. When the servants of the Lord are bold to testify of Christ in his gospel, when the teachers and preachers in the true church, those on the Lord's errand, teach doctrines as the Lord himself would, when the saints of the Most High deliver those words of life which suit and satisfy the soul, when these things happen, testimony and conversion follow. Then people are built up, strengthened, rooted, and grounded in in the faith. 18 verses 8 through 10. Baptism is the first fruits of repentance. It is an ordinance, a sign of a covenant, an outward expression of the acceptance of and the participation in a two-way promise. The initiate promises God certain things in return. God promises certain blessings. According to Alma, persons desiring to enter the kingdom of God promise to one bear another's burdens, two, mourn with those that mourn, three, comfort those that stand in need of comfort, and four, stand as a witness of God at all times. In return, God promises the obedient souls may be one, redeemed from death, two, numbered with those of the first resurrection, and three, inheritors of eternal life. Going down into the watery grave through immersion is but a symbolic representation of one's beliefs and acceptance of the atonement of the Lord Jesus. 
Just as the Savior was laid in the grave and came forth a new glorified person, so too the symbolic nature of baptism is to be buried and then come forth as a new creature in Christ. Let's learn the true symbolism of baptism, brothers and sisters. It does not wash away sins. It's the Holy Ghost that burns sin out of us. Baptism is not symbolic of washing away sins. Baptism is symbolic of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We bury the natural man in the waters and come forth a new man in Christ. That's the symbolism of baptism. Let's finally teach it right when we go to these baptismal ceremonies. Jeffrey R. Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles summarized the expectation that comes to those who accept baptism. Quote, Alma being baptized... Alma began baptizing all who wished to make a covenant with Christ. He asked that they serve God and keep his commandments, that he may pour out his spirit more abundantly upon them. These new disciples would also demonstrate their faith by coming into the fold of God, being called, being called his people, bearing one another's burdens, mourning with those that mourn, comfort those who stand in need of comfort, Stand as a witness of God at all times and in all things and in all places. Enter into a covenant to serve God and keep his commandments. This declaration by Alma at the Waters of Mormon still stands as the most complete scriptural statement on record as to what the newly baptized commit to do and be. End of quote. Elder Joseph B. Worland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles described the blessings of accepting the covenants of baptism. Quote, I have noted throughout my life that when people come to fully understand the blessings and the power of their baptismal covenant, whether as new converts or as lifelong members of the church, great joy comes into their lives and they approach their duties in the kingdom with contagious enthusiasm. End of quote. Chapter 18, verse 8, the phrase to come into the fold of God meant to be willing to come into the fold of God is to be willing to join the Lord's church. It is to be led by the good shepherd, to be submissive, meek, humble, patient, full of love, willing to submit to all things which the Lord seeth fit to inflict upon him. Yes, God will inflict certain things upon us to try and test us. Even as a child does submit, that should be dust, not cloth. Sorry about that. Even as a child does submit to his father, it is to be attentive to the quiet but certain voice of the shepherd and to follow him and find comfort in his sheepfold. In verse 8, the phrase, bear one another's burdens that they may be light, was, one of the duties of discipleship is the acceptance of membership in the body of Christ, the church. One demonstrates his love for the Lord through single-minded obedience and through keeping himself unspotted from the sins of the world. He also evidences his commitment to Christ through becoming Christ-like, through lifting and strengthening others of the household of faith. Bear ye one another burden, Paul canceled, and so fulfill the law of Christ. With divine assistance, bearing another's burden is not burdensome. Such acts of Christian service sanctify both giver and receiver. Burdens become light through the liberating power of Jesus Christ and through the ministration of the Comforter. Come for unto me, the Savior beckons, all ye that labor are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Again, we see our focus must be on Jesus Christ. Everything we do must be about him, Father, about him, and nothing about us. We must continually center our focus on Christ. Chapter 18, verse 9, the phrase, to mourn with those that mourn. Those who have put on Christ seek to be as Christ, to feel as he feels, and do as he would do. Their hearts are drawn out continually in prayer in behalf of their family and friends, and their bowels are filled with compassion for those to whom, for those who mourn. 
The phrase to comfort those that stand in need of comfort meant the disciples of Christ agrees by covenant to stand, extend a comforting hand, a comforting word, a message of solace and assurance to those who are burdened with a load of care. Like Simon of Serene, true Christians rush to offer assistance to their brothers and sisters in bearing the crosses of the world. Therefore, strengthen your brother in all your conversations, in all your prayers, in all your exhortations, in all your doings, Dr. Cummins 108 says. The phrase, to stand as witness of God at all times, meant the Christian is under obligation not only to bear witness by the word of deed of, and deed of God and of his reality, but also to testify for God that God has offered his beloved son as a ransom and redemption for the benefit and blessings of an otherwise ruined world. And in our day that God has called prophets and apostles, that he has empowered them with keys and priesthoods, and that his church is once more upon the earth. Of these things, the Christian bears fervent witness at home and abroad, in private and in public, at all times and in all places. Faithful endurance to the end, being true to one's testimony in belief and practice through the entirety of one's mortal sojourn, eventuates in that redemption hereafter which the saints of God have come to know as the blessings of the first resurrection, the enjoying and inheriting of eternal life. Elder M. Russell Ballard of the Quorum of Twelve Apostles declared that our baptismal covenants require require righteousness no matter how difficult the circumstances. Quote, when we covenant in the waters of baptism to stand as a witness of God at all times and in all things and in all places, we're not talking slowly about fast and testimony meeting. It may not always be easy, convenient, or politically correct to stand for truth and right, but it is always the right thing to do. Always. End of quote. Chapter 10, 18, verse 10, the phrase, being baptized in the name of the Lord, meant, inasmuch as in Christ dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bold, bodily, since in our Lord is centered, since in our Lord is centered the full intelligence and power and attributes of the Godhead. To be baptized in the name of Christ is to be baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. In verse 10, the phrase, as a witness that you have entered into a covenant with him, meant, Joseph Smith said, God has set many signs on the earth as well as in the heavens. For instance, the oak of the forest, the fruit of the trees, and the herb of the field, all bearing a sign that seed had been planted there. Upon the same principle do I contend that baptism is a sign ordained of God for the believer in Christ to take upon himself in order to enter into the kingdom of God. Baptism is a sign to God, to angels and to heaven, that we do the will of God. And there is no other way beneath the heavens whereby God hath ordained for man to come unto him to be saved and enter into the kingdom of God, except faith in Jesus Christ, repentance, and baptism for the remission of sins. And any other course is, is in vain. Then you have the promise of the gift of the Holy Ghost. End of quote. It is not uncommon to hear other Christians say that water baptism is not essential inasmuch as they maintain that baptism is merely an outward evidence of an inward grace. Having been blessed with the restoration of gospel truths, we respond, no, baptism is the outward manifestation of no understand, of now understanding of no understanding of saving ordinances. A baptism of sprinkling is but a manifestation of a sprinkling of desire, while a baptism by immersion performed under proper authority attests to a full immersion in and complete acceptance of the doctrines and requirements of God, of the kingdom of God. So just as we are baptized by immersion, we are to fully immerse ourselves in the gospel and Church of Jesus Christ. Sister Bonnie D. Parkin of uh, as Relief Society General President explained how Heavenly Father tutors us as we make and keep covenants. Quote, covenants or binding promises between us and Heavenly Father are essential for our eternal progression. Step by step, he tutors us to become like him by enlisting us in his work. 
At baptism, we covenant to love him with all our hearts and love our sisters and brothers as ourselves. In the temple, we further covenant to be obedient, selfless, faithful, honorable, charitable. We covenant to make sacrifices and consecrate all that we have. Forged through priesthood authority, our keeping covenants brings blessings to fill our cups to overflowing. How often do you reflect that your covenants reach beyond mortality and connect you to the divine? Making covenants is the expression of a willing heart. Keeping covenants the expression of a faithful heart. End of quote. Chapter 18, verse 10, the phrase that he may pour out his spirit more abundantly upon you means Elder Robert D. Hells of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles observed that having the Holy Ghost influences our conduct and solidifies our testimonies. Quote, the Holy Ghost gives us the strength and courage to conduct our lives in the ways of the kingdom of God and is the source of our testimony of the Father and the Son. By choosing to be in his kingdom, we separate, not, oscill not isolate ourselves from the world. Our dress will be modest, our thoughts pure, our language clean. The movies and television we watch, the music we listen to, the books, magazines, and newspapers we read will be uplifting. We will choose friends who encourage our eternal goals, and we will treat others with kindness. We will shun the vices of immortality, gambling, tobacco, liquor, and illicit drugs. Our Sunday activities will reflect the commandments of God to remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. We will follow the example of Jesus Christ in the way we treat others. We will live to be worthy to enter the house of the Lord. End of quote. Chapter 18, verse 11, the phrase, they clap their hands for joy, meant the spirit of the gospel is the spirit of joy and gladness. We are to be a righteous and a covenant people without being either austere or ascetic. Some have falsely assumed that discipleship entails becoming a sourpuss for Jesus. End of quote. Chapter 18, verses 12 through 18, the phrase, Alma held the priesthood. President Joseph Fielding Smith explained that Alma had authority to baptize. Quote, we may conclude that Alma held the priesthood before he, with others, became disturbed with King Noah. Whether this is so or not makes no difference because in the Book of Mormon, it's stated differently that he had authority. If he had authority to baptize, that is evident that he had been baptized. Therefore, when Alma baptized himself with Helam, that was not a case of Alma baptizing himself, but merely as a token to the Lord of his humility and full repentance. End of quote. Chapter 18, verse 13. This seems not to be a baptismal prayer as much as a moment of counsel and encouragement and motivation for Helam. It is a statement by Alma as to the seriousness of the moment and the authority by which the ordinance is being performed. The phrase, having authority from the Almighty God, meant, see verse 18, see also Mosiah 23, 16. No ordinance will be, eff be of efficacy efficacy, virtue, and force in and after men are dead unless it is the proper uh, it is the proper ordinance performed in the manner obtained by the Lord in his name and by his authority under the direction of those holding the keys of the priesthood and thereafter it receives the ratifying seal of the Holy Spirit of promise. The phrase, until you are dead as the mortal body, meant Alma is here teaching the same doctrine proclaimed elsewhere by other prophet leaders, the doctrine of enduring faithfully to the end. If a person keeps the commandments and endures until death, then his day of probation is over. His time of testing has come to an end. He cannot therefore fall prey to the adversary or depart from the faith. Isn't that beautiful? If you die on the covenant path and you go to paradise and you are free from the adversary of Satan. The phrase, may the spirit of the Lord be poured out, meant baptism of water is preparatory to the reception of the Holy Ghost, that which the scriptures call the baptism of fire. One is not truly born again until he receives and enjoys the enlivening and sanctifying powers of this spirit in his life. As the covenant of baptism is renewed in the partaking of the sacrament, so the promise of the outpouring of the Spirit is renewed also. The phrase, may he grant unto you eternal life, meant eternal life is a gift. People do not earn eternal life. 
There is no scriptural reference whatsoever to anyone earning the right to go where gods and angels are. Rather, according to the words of the prophets, it is so attested in scripture almost a hundred times, people inherit eternal life. After we have done all that we can do, after we have denied ourselves of ungodliness and worldly lust, then is the grace of God sufficient for us. Then we are sanctified in Christ and eventually made perfect in Christ. Chapter 18, verse 14, the phrase, both Alma and Helam were buried in the water. There is no question but that Alma held the priesthood, was ordained after the holy order of God. Thus he would have been baptized previously. Therefore, when Alma baptized himself with Helam, that was not a case of Alma baptizing himself, but merely a token of the Lord of his humility and full repentance, as we observed earlier. In Alma 5.3, we learn that Alma the Younger was consecrated the high priest over the church under his father. Now, Alma did not organize the church with the idea that they had no church before that time. They had a church from the days of Lehi, and Alma only set things in order. The phrase, they came forth out of the water, being filled with the Spirit, meant one occasion common to the manifestation of the Spirit is the compliance with the gospel ordinances. Immediately on coming up out of the water after they had been baptized, Joseph Smith wrote, we experienced great and glorious blessings from our Heavenly Father. No sooner had I baptized Oliver Cowdery than the Holy Ghost fell upon him, and he stood up and prophesied many things which should shortly come to pass. And again, as soon as I had been baptized by him, I also had the spirit of prophecy when, standing up, I prophesied concerning the rise of this church and many other things connected with the church and this generation of the children of men. We were filled with the Holy Ghost and rejoiced in the God of our salvation. End of Joseph Smith's quote. Chapter 18, verse 16, the phrase, we were filled with the grace of God, means to say that Christian disciples were filled with the grace of God is to say that they were filled with his blessings and his love, more specifically, his spirit. In speaking of the rich outpouring which the saints enjoyed following the ascension of Christ into heaven, Luke wrote, And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Chapter 18, verse 18, the phrase Alma ordained priest. Reference to priests and teachers in the Book of Mormon should not be confused with the office of priest or the office of teacher as known to us in the Aaronic priesthood today. It is believed that the Aaronic or Levitical priesthood did not exist among the Nephites unless it was brought during Christ's visit among them, mainly because prior to Christ there were no Levites among the Nephites. There was the tribe of Manasseh and Joseph. There was no Levites, therefore there was no Aaronic priesthood prior to Christ. Chapter 18, verse 19, the phrase, Teach nothing, save it were the things which he had taught, meant rehearsal and view of that which our leaders have spoken leads to commitment and conviction and helps to maintain orthodoxy and continue in doctrine and practice. It is also the perfect system, one ordained by God himself, to ensure that those so preach will be filled with the Spirit and be able to properly expand and expand upon that which has already been revealed. As Joseph Smith taught, quote, We cannot keep all the commandments without first knowing them, and we cannot know we cannot expect to know all or more than we now know unless we comply with or keep those we have already received. End of quote. Later, when Alma's little colony joined the saints in Zarahemla under Mosiah, Alma was delegated responsibility for the church. They did assemble themselves together in different bodies, being called churches, every church having their priest and their teachers, and every priest preaching the word according as it was delivered to him by the mouth of Alma. That would most likely be high priest, because they functioned after the order of the Melchizedek priesthood. Mormon then explained the reason for the system of preaching, and thus, notwithstanding there being many churches, they were all one church, yea, even the church of God. 18 verse 20, preach nothing save it were repentance and faith. That phrase meant 
Mormon writes that under Alma's leadership, there was nothing preached in all the churches except it were repentance and faith in God. To preach repentance is to preach the gospel, to declare the reality of Jesus Christ and him crucified, to proclaim that salvation is in him and through the principles and ordinances of the gospel. In commanding his people to preach nothing but repentance, it was not the intent of Alma or Mosiah to, pre to preclude the preaching of other doctrines and principles, even including that which the scriptures call the mysteries of the kingdom. Rather, the teaching of the first principles must proceed and thus lay the foundation for that which must and will follow. It is a sad commentary when someone utilizes such a dex to convey spiritual lethargy, lethargy, to excuse himself from the responsibility to feed his spirit and thus continue to grow in gospel understanding. To limit our teaching to two principles of the gospel would seem to question the wisdom of the Lord in giving us the marvelous truths found in the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine Comes, the Pearl of Great Price, and for that matter, the Bible, all of which he has commanded us to teach. So in order to teach faith and repentance, and that only, you must also teach the faith, repentance, baptism, the gifts of the Holy Ghost, the atonement, the fall, redemption, the, the natural man, overcoming the natural man, all of that is included in teaching repentance and faith. Chapter 18, verse 21, the phrase, there should be no more contention. One of the overarching purposes of the church in any age is to bring the saints to a unity of the faith. Christ is not interested in diversity. Don't fall for that ideology of Satan. Christ is interested in unity. To help them to rise above petty jealousies and insecurities. To motivate them to transcend self and to look to the needs of others. And to cause them to seek and obtain the quality of love which is Christ-like. The phrase, they should look forward with one eye, meant to look forward with one eye is to be single-minded, focused, and riveted on the cause of Christ. It is to be more concerned about building up the kingdom of God and establishing his righteousness in the earth than with personal achievement or self-aggrandizement. It is to have an eye single to the glory of God. Chapter 18, verse 21, the phrase, hearts knit together in unity and love, meant through modern revelation, the Lord counsel, be one. And if you are not one, you are not mine. Again, Christ is interested in us becoming unified in Christ. Not diversified, unified. President Harry B. Iron of the First Presidency commented on the division prevalent in our fallen world and how keeping the commandments brings unity. Quote, with the fall, it became clear that living in unity would not be easy. We need hope that we can experience unity in this life and qualify to have it forever in the world to come. If we are to have unity, there are commandments we must keep concerning how we feel. We must forgive and bear no malice towards those who offend us. End of quote. The way to become unified as a people is to become united in Christ. If we will all become of one heart and one mind, meaning one heart with Christ and one mind in Christ, then we will become unified together as a people. It must be in Christ. Until unity and love come as the people of Alma recommitted themselves to living the commandments of God. While serving in the 70, Elder C. Maxwell Caldwell described this increase in love as a condition that needs to be developed. Quote, Jesus' love was inseparably connected to and resulted from his life of serving, sacrificing, and giving in behalf of others. We cannot develop Christ-like love except by practicing the process prescribed by the, ma the Master. Charity is not just a precept or a principle, nor is it just a word to describe actions or attitudes. Rather, it is an internal condition that must be developed and experienced in order to be understood. We are possessors of charity when it is a part of our nature. People who have charity have a love for the Savior, have received of his love, and love others as he does. End of quote. Chapter 18, verse 23, the phrase, Observe the Sabbath day and keep it holy, meant, Because the Sabbath day is a holy day, it should be reserved for worthy and holy activities. If we merely lounge about doing nothing on the Sabbath, we fail to keep the day holy. 
Elder L. Tom Perry of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles spoke about how the Sabbath is a special time for families to be together and reviewed and reviewed ten other activities of many that are worthy of the Sabbath day. Quote, he said, This is the time we are to attend our regular meetings together, study the life and teachings of the Savior and the prophets. Other appropriate Sabbath Sunday activities include, one, writing personal and family journals, two, holding family councils, three, establishing and maintaining family organizations for the immediate and extended family, four, personal interviews between parents and children, Five, writing to relatives of missionaries. Six, genealogy. Seven, visiting relatives and those who are ill or lonely. Eight, doing missionary work. Nine, reading stories to children. And ten, singing church hymns. End of quote. Elder Marky Peterson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles taught that our observance of the Sabbath day reflects our appreciation of the atonement of Jesus Christ. Quote, we can readily see that observance of the Sabbath is an indication of the depth of our conversion. Our observance or non-observance of the Sabbath is an unerring measure of our attitude towards the Lord personally and towards his suffering in Gethsemane, his death on the cross, and his resurrection from the dead. It is a sign of whether we are Christian in very deed or whether our conversion is so shallow that commemoration of his atoning sacrifice means little or nothing to us. End of quote. How we treat the Sabbath is an indication of what we think and how we treat the Savior. Chapter 18, verse 23, the phrase, Every day they should give thanks, meant the plan of the great Jehovah is that people become a holy nation, a kingdom of priests. Holiness is a product of righteous living on all days and at all times, not simply the result of six days of secularity and one day of sacredness. True it is that the saints are asked to pay their devotions to the Most High on the Sabbath. Nevertheless, the Lord of the Sabbath has instructed, Thy vows shall be offered up in righteousness on all days and at all times. Chapter 18, verse 26, the phrase, For their labors they were to receive the grace of God, that they might watch, wax strong in the Spirit, having the knowledge of God referred to. Spiritual labor is its own reward, a labor not motivated by the idea of temporal remuneration. Those who receive the grace of God, who seek and obtain the guidance of the Holy Spirit, come to have the knowledge of God. They gain the mind of Christ, and they receive pure knowledge, knowledge from a pure source, and they come to know things about God and about God's purposes and ways that others will never know. When they speak, therefore they speak as persons having authority. Being fit receptacles, they speak with the power and authority of their master. Chapter 18, verses 27 through 29, the phrase, the people of the church should impart of their substance. A religion that cannot save a person temporally has not the power to save them spiritually. Indeed, with God, all things are spiritual, and it matters quite as much to him that men have their stomachs filled with food as it does that they have their souls filled with light. The society of Zion is made up of people who have put their trust in the Spirit, which leads to do good, to do justly, and to walk humbly, to judge righteously. The people of such a holy commonwealth seek the interest of their neighbors, for they have come to love their neighbors as themselves. They are consecrated in principle and practice. Those who have given freely and those who have not willingly received in the right spirit those who have given freely and those who have not willingly received in the right spirit, both are sanctified in the process. I'm not sure that last phrase is right. Those who have given freely and those who have willingly received in the right spirit. So that not should not be there. Those who have willingly Received in the right spirit, both are sanctified in the process. King Benjamin taught his people that for the sake of retaining the remission of your sins from day to day, that you may walk guiltless before God, I would that you should impart of your substance to the poor. Every man according to that which he hath 
such as feed the hungry, clothe the naked, visiting the sick, and ministering to the relief, both spiritually and temporally, according to their wants. In a modern revelation, the Lord explained that the saints are to be equal, or in other words, you are to have equal claims on the properties in the storehouse for the benefit of managing the concerns of your stewardship, every man according to his wants and his needs, inasmuch as his wants are just. We are not to seek after unjust wants. So being equal to God means not everybody has exactly the same thing. It means you have what you need and want to fulfill your stewardships. President Mary and G. Romney of the First Presidency Council has developed charity by giving over ourselves fully to the work of the Lord. Quote, Some may ask, how do I obtain those righteous feelings in giving? How do I overcome giving grudgingly? How do I obtain the pure love of Christ? To those I would say, faithfully live all the commandments, give yourselves, care for your family, serve in church callings, perform mission work, pay tithes and offerings, study the scriptures, and the list could go on. As you lose yourself in the service, the Lord will touch and soften your heart. End of quote. Chapter 18, verses 30 through 35. The phrase, the king said that Alma was stirring up the people to rebellion against him meant this comment dramatically typifies the neurotic and paranoid frenzy of one entangled in sin and embroiled in a warfare against all that is good. Like Herod the Great, Noah, this is wicked king Noah in the Book of Mormon, was suspicious of his own shadow. Because he was less than trustworthy, he trusted not a soul. The rebellious of souls are never content to wallow in their own wickedness. Frequently, they must also labor with unholy zeal to thwart the good and prevent the righteous from succeeding. It is not enough that Alma had left King Noah's employ and gone into the wilderness. Noah was a man consumed with passion and haunted, like most of his kind, with a paranoia concerning persons who want to do what is right. See, isn't that interesting? The wicked can't leave the righteous alone. They must try to drag them down so that they feel comfortable in their wickedness. Chapter 18, verse 30, the phrase, How beautiful are they to the eyes of them who there came to the knowledge of their Redeemer. There is a peaceful excitement, an indescribable joy associated with true conversion. Such moments, occasions, results in precious memories, memories of time and place and person, which will linger through the out eternities. Converts feel an overwhelming sense of love and gratitude for those who first presented the gospel message to them. They recall with tearful appreciation, decades later, many of the details associated with their baptism and entrance into the Lord's kingdom. Let's now turn to Mosiah chapter 19. Mosiah 19, um, nine, chapters 19 through 24. Here's a little de introduction. People of Limhi compared to the people of Alma. Through, and this is chapters 19 through 24. When the prophet Benai first went to the wicked people of King Noah, he told them if they did not repent, they would come under bondage. When the Lord commanded Abinadi to return to them two years later, they still had not repented. Therefore, according to the word of the Lord, all of them would inevitably come under bondage. Even Here's a great principle we miss. Even if they repent now, because now Abinadi says if they don't repent, they'll be destroyed. But since they didn't repent the first time, they must come under bondage even after they have repented. We'll see that with the of Alma and his people. When the Lord commanded Abinadi to return two years later, they still had not repented. Therefore, according to the word of the Lord, all of them would inevitably come under bondage. They had to suffer the consequences of not repenting the first time. Furthermore, the second time Abinadi preached and the Lord's warning to the people of Kim Hai, King Noah was even stronger. In addition to being brought to bondage, many would be slain. Others would experience famine and pestilence, and if they still refused to repent, they would be destroyed. After Abinadi's second visit, there was a division among the people. Alma believed Abinadi, and a group of people listened to Alma, repented, and became righteous. However, the majority of the people under the leadership of King Noah and then his son Lemhi did not re repent until much later. Although both groups eventually came under bondage because they refused to repent after the first warning of the Lord, 
consider the following differences between what happened to Limhi's group who voluntarily repented and Limhi's group who were compelled to repent. This is an important principle, brothers and sisters. I may repent and become active in the church and try to do better, but still suffer the consequences of past bad choices. So remember that. You can still repent it and still suffer the consequences of bad past choices before you repented. And you may still suffer those consequences after you have repented. Don't let that throw you. So here is the two people compared together. So here is a chart describing the difference between people of Limai and Alma from Mosiah 19 through 24, those chapters. Abinadi's second visit. Noah's people rejected and killed Abinadi. They continued in their wickedness. Alma believed Abinadi. Alma was forced to flee. After, aftermath of Abinadi's second visit. Noah and Lemai's people continued in wickedness. They were divided. They were contentious. They were attacked by the Lamanites. King Noah was killed by his own people. The people were brought into Lamanite bondage and had to pay a 50% tribute to the Lamanites. A small group believed Alma. They traveled to hear Alma preach. They were taught to repent and have faith. They co covenanted with God. They escaped the efforts of King Noah to destroy them. Two years from the time of Abinadi's death, Limhi's people endured bondage. They endured bondage and 50% tribute. The Lamanites attacked. They fought back. They accepted bondage. Alma's people prospered. The Lord strengthened them. They built a city called Helam. A period of time following the first two years. Conditions of bondage intensified for Limhi. The Lamanites smote them on the cheeks and exercised authority over them. The Lamanites gave Limhi's people heavy burdens and drove them like animals. The people murmured because of their trials. Limhi's people went to war three times to deliver themselves and were defeated each time. Many were killed and there was much sorrow. Alma's people continued in peace and prosperity, we read in Mosiah 23. They lived in righteousness. They prospered exceedingly. Continued after first two years. Limai's people repented and turned to the Lord. They were compelled to be humble. They accepted their bondage and abuse. They cried mildly to the Lord. They sent men to find help in Zarahemla. While Alma's people continued in peace and prosperity. Continued after the first two years, the Lord eventually delivered them from the Lamanite bondage. The Lord was slow to hear them, but he softened the hearts of their enemies who eased their burdens. They were not delivered at first. They prospered by degrees. They helped others. They covenanted to serve God. They gave wine to the Lamanite guards who then fell asleep, and then they were able to make an escape from bondage. The people of Alma, Alma's people, continued in peace and prosperity. Now, from 120 to 121 BC, Limhi's people arrived in the land of Zarahemla. A Lamanite army pursued Limhi's people. Alma's people experienced bondage and delivery from the Lord. Now, even though they are repentant and live in prosperity, remember they had to experience bondage because both groups did not repent the first time Abinadi came. Therefore, even though Alma's people are repentant, they have to suffer those consequences of the bad choice they made not to repent the first time Abinadi came. So it is too with us. We may repent of sins and come and have peace and be forgiven, but we may also still suffer some consequences because of bad choices we made prior to our repentance. The Lamanites' army sent after Limhi's people discovered Alma's people in the land of Helam. Alma's people were taken into bondage. They remained faithful and endured patiently. The Lord eased their burdens and strengthened them. The Lord delivered them out of bondage and in the land of Zarahemla miraculously. So you can see because they chose to repent before the people of Limhi did, how yes, they still went through bondage, but they endured better and were miraculously slaved because of their repentant attitude and were not compelled to repent and be humble. Lemai's people were forced to remember the Lord during the Lamanite bondage. 
Alma's people willingly repented after Abinadi's second warning. Consequently, the suffering of Lin's high group was greater and more prolonged. Some years later, Alma the Younger explained a principle that helps us understand the different results experienced by these two groups. Some are compelled to be humble, for a man sometimes, if he is compelled to be humble, seeketh repentance. And blessed are they who humble themselves without being compelled to be humble. You will receive more blessings. Chapter 19 now, verses 1 through 19. Intelligence cleaveth unto intelligence, wisdom receiveth wisdom, truth embraceth truth, virtue loveth virtue, light cleaveth unto light, mercy hath compassion on mercy, and claimeth her own, justice continueth its course, and claimeth its own, judgments goeth forth before the face of him who sitteth upon the throne, and governeth, and executeth all things, as Dr. Covenants 88 says. So speaks the revelations to which we might add, drawing upon the lesson of King Noah's treatment of Abinadi that evil begets evil selfishness engenders more selfishness meanness encourages meanness corruption attracts corruption hatred spawns hatred depravity seeks company with depravity greed feeds upon greed and anger produces anger for all things produce after their own image and in their own likeness just as one is in opposition to the other there must be opposition in all things Chapter 19, verses 20 through 19. In fulfillment of Abinadi's prophecy, King Noah is put to death by fire at the hands of his own people. The priests of Noah flee into the wilderness, and their city-state comes under the bondage to the Lamanites. Such events are but an affirmation of the verity that whatsoever, whosoever diggeth the pit shall fall therein, and he that rolleth a stone, it will return upon him. That's from Saul, Proverbs. God has promised to re recompense unto every man according to his work, and measure to every man according to the measure which he measured to his fellow man. As I treat others, God will treat me. I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, he says in Jeremiah. He promised and will recompense all upon thee, and will recompense upon thee all thine abominations, as he said in Ezekiel. It is a righteous thing with God, Paul wrote, to recompense tribute to them that trouble with you. Kings and kingdoms, the great and the small, are all subject to the laws of recompense by a just God, who either in this life or the world to come balances all accounts. So if I have been unjust, I will be recompensed with injustice. If I have been unmerciful, I will be recompensed with unmerciful. If I am merciful, I will be recompensed with mercy. You cannot escape the consequences of your choices, as Elder Maxwell stated. Quote, actually everything depends initially and finally on our desires. These shape our thought patterns. Our desires will precede our deeds and lie at the very core of our souls, tilting us towards or away from God. God can educate our desires. End of quote. Others seek to manipulate our desires, but it is we who form the desires. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. This is a slide that we've already has said. Others seek to manipulate our desires. It is we who form the desires and thoughts and tents of our hearts. So this repetition slide should be deleted. Sorry about that. The end rule is, according to our desires, shall it be done unto us. This is still quoting Elder Maxwell. For I, the Lord, will judge all men according to their works, according to the desire of their hearts. One's individual will thus remains uniquely his. God will not override it, nor overwhelm it. In other words, God will never take our agency away. Hence, we had better want the consequences of what we want. End of quote. Remember that, brothers and sisters. You had better want the consequences of what you want. Because that's what you will receive. Let's go now to Mosiah chapter 20. 
verses 1 through 26. The nation of Israel was formed by God with a prophet chosen by him to stand at its head. The law of Moses, which governs the nation, was given by revelation and could only be amended in the same manner. It was divine intent that Israel always be led by prophets. This being the case, it was essential that sinistry of the nation be able to discern between the true and false prophets. To that end, Moses, the first prophet to the nation of Israel, established the first scriptural test by which prophets were to be discerned. He said, When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, he said, If the thing falleth not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken, but the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid of him. We could hardly be expected to reverence a prophet, one who prophecies fail to come to pass. As the story unfolds in Mosiah 20, we find the people of the city of Lehi-Nephi attesting that the prophecies of Abinadi have been fulfilled and that their condition of bondage is as they were told it would be the result of their iniquity. Oh, that living prophets could be recognized and honored as our dead ones. Yet such has ever been the plight of those who prefer iniquity to purity. Strive to enter at the straight gate, the Savior implored. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. When once the master of the house has risen up and has shut the door, and you begin to stand without and knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. And he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not from whence you are. Then shall you begin to say, We have eaten and drunken in thy presence, and thou hast taught in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you, I know not from whence ye are. Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then shall ye see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, and ye yourselves thrust out. That is the consequence of not following prophets. We will knock at the door and seek to come in. But Christ will say, I don't know who you are. You never followed the prophets. Therefore, you do not get a prophet's reward, which is to come unto me. Chapter 21, Mosiah 21. 21, 1 through 12. In these verses, we find a more specific detail of the filling of Abinadi's prophet relative to the bondage of the people of the city of Nephi. Though their plight was now most pitiful, we would err to suppose that God had forgotten them. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, the Lord said, charging such to be zealous, therefore, and repent. To be chastened is to be subject to pain, suffering, deprivation, and misfortune, in order to correct, strengthen, and, per and perfect behavior. Chapter 21, verses 13 through 22. The Lord who is patient and long-suffering, even with evil, may be equally slow to redeem the transgressor. The seeds of iniquity are not easily uprooted. Time and suffering are part of the healing process. The blessings of heaven are not cheaply obtained. One hardly merits the company of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the exalted of all ages, by the mere profession of faith or the lamentation for sin. A mere verbal repentance is hardly good training for the discipline necessary in keeping the commandments. As Doctrine and Covenants 101, 7-8 states, They were slow to hearken unto the voice of the Lord their God. Therefore, the Lord their God is slow to hearken unto their prayers, to answer them in the day of their trouble. In the day of their peace they esteem lightly my counsel, but in the day of their trouble of necessity they fill after me. So God will respond as quickly as we respond to him, or as slowly as we respond. Chapter 21, verse 15, the phrase, the Lord did hear their cries. Even though many people in the colony brought their distress upon themselves, the Lord was merciful and answered their prayers. The prophet Joseph Smith described the Lord's mercy in response to the sorrow the prophet felt as a result of his mistakes. Quote, I have called to mind all the past moments of my life, and I am left to mourn and shed tears of sorrow for my following in suffering the adversary of my soul to have so much power over me as he has had in, past, in times past. But God is merciful and has forgiven my sins, and I rejoice that he sent forth the comforter unto as many as believe and humbleth themselves before him. End of quote. Chapter 21, verses 23 through 28. The small company from Lehi left the land of Lehi-Nephi to return to Zarahemla. 
they became lost in the wilderness, passed by Zarahemla, and reached the land of desolation in the north, the land wherein the first battles of the Jaredites had taken place. Finding the land covered with bones and weapons, they assumed that their kindred in Zarahemla had been destroyed. Among the ruins and desolation brought back by the delegation were 24 gold plates, the record of the Jaredites, written and prepared by Ether. This party returned to Lehi-Nephi only days before Ammon and his brethren were found and captured. Chapter 21, verses 30 through 31. It ought not be lost upon the reader that those who joined Alma at the waters of Mormon and entered into the covenant of repentance and baptism escaped the bondage and suffering opposed upon those of the city of Nephi that would cause them to flee into the wilderness. Our story bespeaks the verity that gospel covenants faithfully kept bring both spiritual and temporal freedom, while iniquity brings both spiritual and temporal bondage. Chapter 20, verses 32 through 36. Having rehearsed the sufferings of the children of Israel during their wilderness wanderings, the Apostle Paul wrote, Now all these things happened unto them, for in samples that they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. So obviously is the Lord's purpose in the preservation of the kind of story being presented, told in Mosiah. How singularly significant it is that as the people of the city of Nephi humbled themselves, turned again to their God, and then entered into a covenant to honor and serve him, events began to happen that would bring them the freedom they had been able to obtain by their courage and their swords. These are stories for us and our day. For we must follow the same example if we are to be saved. Chapter 21, verse 33, the phrase, None that had authority from God, meant little or no effort is made in the Book of Mormon to detail or explain the nature of the priesthood and church government. No systematic treatment of such matters as priesthood, offices, quorum, councils, or even the organization of the church itself. Such was not its purpose. The Book of Mormon is more a narrative of a family <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> then an ecclesiastical history. What it makes abundantly clear, however, the Nephite prophets leave no question, is the necessity for the ordinances of salvation and the proper authority to perform them. Chapter 21, verse 35, the phrase, they were desirous to be baptized as a witness and a testimony meant, the covenant of baptism is here aptly described as a witness and a testimony that we are willing to serve God with all our hearts. In turn, it is our right to expect the power of heaven, contingent upon our worthiness, to sustain us at all times and in all places we may be in. Let's go now to Mosiah chapter 22. Chapter 22, verses 1 through 16. As with their old world counterpart, this new world remnant of the house of Israel seek and find deliverance from the oppression of their enemies at the hands of the Lord of hosts, rather than with the sword and the arm of flesh. And such deliverance comes only when they have turned their hearts in trust towards him who had promised to preserve them and fight their battles. The plea of the Nephites was the plea of David. Plead my cause, O Lord, with them that strive with me. Fight against them that fight against me. Take hold of shield and buckler and stand up for mine help. Draw out also the spear and stop the, the way against them that persecute me. Say unto my soul, I am thy salvation. Further, the temporal deliverance of the Lord's people is but a type, an illustration of the Holy One's role in delivering his chosen from the fiery darts of the evil one. Only in and through Christ are they redeemed from the oppression of him who sought man's bondage from the beginning. The psalmist plea thus continued, Let them be confounded and put to shame that seek after my soul. Let them be turned back and brought to confusion that devise my hurt. It is only in and through Christ we will be spared. It is him we must seek our salvation, our help, our deliverance from the natural man. Let's go now to Mosiah chapter 23. 23 verse 2, the phrase, The Lord did strengthen them. Jehovah giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fail. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. 
They shall mount upon wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint, as Isaiah prophesies in chapter 40. Chapter 23, verses 6 through 13. The phrase, and the people were desirous that Alma should be their king. The power vested in a monarch to do good is matched only by the power he possesses to do evil. Kings set the moral tone for their nation. In positions of kingship, we can list the likes of Melchizedek, the king of Salem, who taught principles of righteousness with such effect that he and his people were caught up to join the city of Enoch. Of King Benjamin, who gave the name of Christ to his people and led them in making a sacred covenant to be obedient to all the commandments of God. For that matter, Jesus the Savior will reign as King of kings and Lord of lords in the great millennial day. Yet Alma had experienced the wickedness and unholy practice of a tyrannical, tyrannical monarch. He knew only too well of King Noah, who had led his people in depravity and debauchery, and thus to bondage and destruction. Surely he would have known from the writings on the plates of brass of the likes of King Ahab, who, Noah like, did more to provoke the Lord of Israel to anger in the old world than all the kings of Israel that went before him. Even though a righteous king is chosen, there is no way to assure that those who succeed him will be of like spirit. Thus, Alma encourages people to stand fast in the liberty wherein they have been made free, and admonishes them to wisdom, entrusting no one to be a king over them. Chapter 23, verse 10, the phrase, a knowledge of the truth. Here Alma associates repentance with obtaining a knowledge of the truths of God. Such knowledge is acquired only by those who traverse the paths of righteousness. Only those who walk in the ordinances of the Lord have the promise they will find wisdom and great treasures of knowledge, even hidden treasures. Chapter 23, verse 14, the phrase, Trust no one to be your teacher, nor your minister, except you be a man of God. The care we take and the choice of a physician ought be nothing in comparison with the caution we take and the choice of those with whom we trust our eternal well-being. A wise father observed that he would rather trust his sheep to the care of a wolf than his children to a teacher who did not willingly keep the commandments of God. Jesus of Nazareth said it thus, quote, Whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hung about his neck and that he were drowned in the depths of the sea. End of quote. What then of those who offend the infant in things of faith, the spiritually insecure, or those who believe or trust too readily? It matters little to the harvest if those sowing tares with the wheat do so maliciously or in ignorance. Safety rests with allowing none to be our teacher or our spiritual leaders unless they be men and women of God. Chapter 23, verse 15, the phrase, Every man should love his neighbor as himself. While they partook of what had become to be called the Last Supper, Christ instructed the twelve, said, Quote, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another. As I have loved you, ye shall also love one another. And then he added, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have loved one to another. End of his quote. We do not suppose that this was the first time such a commandment had been given, for we know it was not. Rather, we understand that Christ desired those who would be his disciples to place a renewed emphasis on the importance of their loving one another. For that love was requisite to their having his spirit and would stand as evidence that they were true messengers of God. It will be recalled that early in the ministry, Christ said to his disciples, Therefore all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. This charge contained no suggestion of originality, for he added, For this is the law and the prophets. That is to say, the responsibility to love our neighbor as part was given as part of the law on Sinai, and the practice of, doing, of so doing was the example of all prophets. It would be wholly inconsistent for people to profess to be chosen of the Lord and at the same time to despise and hate their neighbors. Chapter 23, verse 16, the phrase, He being the founder. Having laid the foundation of the church among this people, Alma is properly referred to 
as its founder. This is not to suggest that the church originated with him any more than the expression their church was intended to mean that the church originated on the initiative of the people rather than with God. Alma 27, 23, verse 17. It is evident that Alma held both priesthood and keys. Keys are the right of presidency, the authority that controls and directs the activities, functions, and ordinances of the priesthood, thus assuring that the Lord's house will always be a house of order. 23.18, the phrase, nourish them with things pertaining to righteousness. Spiritual strength is inseparably connected with righteousness. Many have attempted to find strength or or nourishment for their spirit with some form of positive thinking. It need be remembered that the devil and his legions can both take and teach courses in positive thinking and self-assertiveness. That of which the scripture writ speaks is a power that can only had be had only in righteousness. So even Satan knows how to do positive powerful thinking. That is not how you obtain righteousness and power. It is through righteousness and righteousness in Christ. 23 verse 21, the phrase, he trieth their patience and their faith. Meant, Even though the people who followed Alma had repented and been faithful, the Lord allowed them to be temporarily oppressed by the Lamanites in fulfillment of Abinadi's prophecy and as a trial of their patience and faith. We can hardly lay claim to any attribute of godliness unless we have been tried and tested on the matter. It is meaningless to say that someone is filled with love if he has never been in situations that evokes hate, that he is courageous if he has never been in a situation that elicits fear, that he is generous if he has never been called upon to share, and so forth. In other words, to experience one thing, you must experience its opposite. It was an epic trial that merited for Abraham the title Father of the Faithful. There are no conquering heroes unless there are great battles to be fought. Elder Orson F. Whitney of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles taught that everything we experience teaches us valuable lessons. Quote, no pain that we suffer, no trial that we experience is wasted. It ministers to our education, to the development of such qualities as patience, faith, fortitude, and humility. And I would ask if we let the suffering do that for us, if we let it. Back to his quote. All that we suffer and all that we endure, especially when we endure it patiently, builds up our character, purifies our hearts, expands our souls, and makes us more tender and charitable, more worthy to be called the children of God. And it is through sorrow and suffering, toil and tribulation, that we gain the education that we came here to acquire, and which will make us more like our Father and Mother in Heaven. End of quote. Again, if we let the suffering trials do so. Just sheer suffering doesn't make us wise and and patient because we all suffer not all of us are wise and patient it's those who t learn from their suffering that all of these things elder whitney says will happen chapter 23 verse 23 the phrase none could deliver him but the lord this is one reason why the lord allowed the people of alma to come into bondage one, because they had rejected the warnings of Benedict's first visit, and second, to show the people that it is only in and through the Lord Omnipotent that anyone can be brought out of bondage, physically or spiritually. Chapter 23, verse 35, Amulon and his brother did join the Nephilimites. It would appear from the story of the Book of Mormon that every dissenter or splinter group eventually found their way into the society of the Lamanites. Just like every apostate of the church today will find their way into the society of the worldly. Let's now go to Mosiah chapter 24, our last chapter. Mosiah 23 and 24, the history of Alma's people. Mosiah chapters 23 through 24 is a flashback within a flashback. The history of Alma from the time that they were driven to the wilderness by the people of King Noah until they arrived in Zarahemla was added to the record. This small flashback occupies approximately 20 years. When the reader finishes chapters 23 through 24, both Zenith's people and Alma's people have returned to Zarahemla and King Mosiah. Chapter 24, verses 1 through 6. 
Even as the minions of the devil know not the mind of God, so the Lord may use all things and all people to work his purposes. It was by the authority and decree of a pagan king that Israel was allowed to return from her Babylonian captivity and rebuilt her precious temple in the old world. In like manner, it was prophesied that the protection of rights offered by a Gentile nation would allow the Book of Mormon and the fullness of the gospel to be brought forth in the last days. So it is in our present text that we find the hand of the Lord at work among people who refuse to acknowledge him. The priests of Amulon are placed in a position to teach the language of the Nephites to the Lamanites in order that proper records may be kept. Unwittingly, this action would facilitate the subsequent teaching of the gospel among the Lamanites by such great missionaries as the sons of Mosiah and their missionary associates. God can work miracles even with those who do not believe in the gospel and do not believe in him, since he is all-knowing. Chapter 24, verses 10 through 16, the phrase, So great were their afflictions that they began to cry mightily to God. In the economy and omniscience of God, it was intended that morality be a time of trial, a place of struggle. And it is in his extremities, in the fiery flames of adversity, that man often finds the needed motivation to search out and come to know his God. It is not to be supposed that gospel covenants and promises shelter man from the winds and storms from which come to all. Indeed, acceptance of the responsibilities of mortality and the agreement to be in the world but not of the world supposes that the saints of the Most High will suffer for well-doing, will undergo tribulation in their Redeemer's name. Since the saints have been called upon to bear greater burdens, a merciful God endows them with power from on high, with vision and strength that they, even in suffering, might have dominion over all things. The promise is sure that whosoever will put their trust in God shall be supported in their trials, not from them, and their troubles and their afflictions, and shall be lifted up at the last day. Such has been the blessings granted to their fathers in Egypt. Though taskmasters were set to scourge them, the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. Brother and sister, do not make the mistake that if I am active in the church and live the gospel, that I will be then relieved from problems of trials and sufferings. No, I will most likely gain more as the more I grow, so that I can grow even more. Chapter 23, verses 13 through 15, the phrase they did submit cheerfully and with patience to all the will of the Lord. If we are entirely dependent upon God, then he can take our limitations and our weaknesses and magnify them into strengths useful for his divine purposes. Elder Richard G. Scott of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles encouraged encouraged us to cheerfully rely on the Lord when we face the challenges of mortality. Quote, Problems or trials in our lives need to be viewed in the perspective of scriptural doctrine. Otherwise, they can be easily overtake our vision, absorb our energy, and deprive us of the joy and beauty the Lord intends us to receive here on earth. Some people are like rocks thrown into a sea of problems. They are drowned by them. Be a cork. When submerged in a problem, fight to be free, to bob up, to serve again with happiness. The Lord is intent on your personal growth and development. That progress is accelerated when you willingly allow him to lead you through every growth experience you encounter, whether initially it be to your individual liking or not. When you trust in the Lord, when you are willing to let your heart and your mind be centered in His will, when you ask to be led by the Spirit to do His will, you are assured of the greatest happiness along the way and the most fulfilling attainment from this mortal experience. If you question everything you are asked to do or dig in your hills at every unpleasant challenge, you make it harder for the Lord to bless you. End of quote. Chapter 24, verse 14, that ye may stand as witness for me hereafter. As the faith of our pioneer forebear stands as a witness to modern Latter-day Saints that the Lord is in the work, so the testimony of Alma's people would stand as a witness to their posterity that the hand of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is ever extended to his chosen people. This is one reason for reading scripture, so that we can see the Lord's hand in other people's lives. And if God did it then, he will have a hand in our lives too, if we live the laws and commandments.
Chapter 24, verse 22, they gave thanks to God. There is a spiritual strength manifest in a people's eagerness to acknowledge the hand of the Lord in all things, in their readiness to confess his mercy and omnipotence. Thank you for watching. Hopefully this helped you with these chapters and some of the doctrines and principles that are taught in these wonderful chapters and about from Abinadi and Alma. May we learn from them and progress and use our challenging afflictions to become stronger and smarter and know more and come closer to God. If the presentation helps you, please hit the like button.